Hey everybody, welcome back to Performance on Wheels. This is part three of our three-part series. Uh, we started with uh, a buyer's guide followed by cost of ownership. This is gonna be our full vehicle review and our new part four of the part three series, we're gonna extend it a bit, is we no longer own this vehicle. We just sold it. Yeah, it's so in today's video, we're specifically talking about a review. Uh, we're gonna try to keep it short and sweet. We'll do our best in that, just kinda uh, pointing out the highlights of the Range Rover Supercharge. Let's get right into it. Put a little context to the video so you guys know what we are talking about. We are talking about the 2010 to 2012 Range Rover specifically. We are looking at a supercharged model. Now, the L322, the third generation Range Rover that we're looking at, started back in 2001, and there's kind of three different generations within that third generation. Started off as a BMW, kind of moved over to Ford ownership, and then starting in 2010, owned by Tata Motors, it's more specific to the JLR, the Jaguar Land Rover brand. Now, it is a Land Rover Range Rover, so it's technically a model of Land Rover. However, Today in 2020, it's a little confusing because there's Range Rover Evokes and Range Rover Velars and Range Rover Range Rovers. So I, I don't really get how the whole naming convention works, but today we're looking at the 2010 to 2012, the last hurrah of the L322 third generation Range Rover. A lot of vehicles out here look like what we're looking at today. Kind of what sets it apart in the 2010 model year are the lights. Yeah, those we, are so cool. We actually switched over to some LED lights, uh, which they look awesome. They're very striking, they're bold looking. Hopefully they look well on camera in the daylight. I can tell you they, uh, they have a sense of elegance to them, uh, both during the day, uh, both from the front end and the back end. Uh, they're bright, they're vibrant. Pretty cool 10 year old technology that I think is still relevant today uh, as far as their capability, how bright they are. Good job on that. For sure. This is personally my favorite part of the Range Rover. I just love the big box, the mean, jagged lines, very aggressive styling that Range Rover puts out in this vehicle. It just makes a statement going down the road. Everybody knows what it is, just like the Mercedes G Wagon. Both this and the G-Wagon just have the statement, everybody knows what it is, and it just demands your attention. Uh, they just nailed the design, and that's why it is still a very similar design today. The Land Rover is specific to its off-road capability. Yeah. That is where its main focus is, followed by luxury. Mm -hmm. Range Rover is backwards on that. Luxury came first, and then the off-road capability. So a Land Rover, your uh, LR4s, Discoveries, are gonna be more off-road focused, more outdoorsy, whereas the Range Rover has a lot of the same technology, but it's focuses towards luxury. Although it's a awesome styling cue, it also has that function of the, the upslope and the tucked in exhaust, that you can't really see that exhaust. That, that shows you some of that off-road capability with the departure angle, pretty awesome. There's no getting around the fact that this vehicle is just absolutely huge it's it's really big it so big. so you should expect a very big amount of storage yeah so a lot of people don't know this but it does have a, a tailgate technically right it's like a truck see, it is like a truck and this can support weight whether it looks like it or not as you can see great so i figured i should bring that up uh, but for room and storage wise i'd say it's quite good this is a full size suv yeah, yeah. so this is just shy of something having a third <laughs> row they have the range rover sport which is the completely different model it's smaller uh it, it's not on the same platform it's a different vehicle they yeah. look very similar on the outside but this is the full size range rover over six thousand pounds wow this thing's a beast Wild. so it has a it, it is like a unibody subframe it's not a body on axle mm -hmm. Um, and, and there's a lot of aluminum. However, th the main structure is still steel. You know, you, you brought something up to me the other day that the 2020s are actually all aluminum now, so they're what, 600 pounds or 800 pounds lighter? 800 pounds lighter. Yeah, that's wild, it's right. crazy. So there is some aluminum on the L322, the, the hood, front fenders, and the doors, but more or less the entire structure, anything that's not bolted on essentially, is going to be steel, which that's a lot of weight. Oh, well, if they're curious what is aluminum, they can check out part two of our video series, which was uh, the 
buyer's guide. Or no, sorry, not the buyer's guide. It was the other one. It's up here in the corner. Another one of the cool features of the Range Rover is that air suspension. It really uh, makes a difference and it really proves some of the amazing capability. Right now, as you guys are looking at it, this is the access height or known as uh, as low as it can go. You can't drive it this way. It won't let you drive it this way. There's only the, the, the setting that, uh, there's one setting that you can drive the Range Rover in. You can drive it lifted only up to like 40 miles an hour or something like that. The only other time you're gonna see it lower is at speeds excess of 100 plus miles an hour. I think it's like 115. So it'll lower a half inch. From that normal height, with the factory air suspension, it can go up about two inches and it can go down at about two inches. What I can tell you is that that access height is needed. Uh, my mother-in-law, I had it lowered for her, picking it up from the airport. She got in just fine. Uh, I forgot to hit it when she was getting out and I thought I was gonna break her knee. I felt kind of bad about that. So anyways, the air suspension is stellar. When we do a short drive in it, we'll kind of talk about that a little more. And this is it, boys and girls raised all the way on that air suspension. And just like this, let's put it back down. Access height, here we come. This is how fast it goes, check it out. This is real time. Quite quick. Yeah, so that back end is just a squatting. Look at that thing, isn't that cool? Bum, bum, bum. So we went from like off-road menacing to gangsta, just like that. What I do like about the third generation, especially on the model years we're talking about, that 2010 to 2012, there were a lot of advancements uh, that took place during those years. Bringing it up to a, a level that I feel is still relevant uh, 10, 11 years later. One thing that they did drop the ball on, however, is, is the key fob. So you have a, a key fob with push button start that was introduced during this time frame. However, it, there's, no, there's no touch and go, there's no locking. You still have to pull the old clunker out of your pocket, unlock and lock your doors. Now, once you get in, you can keep that stowed away for that push button, but let's take a closer peek at the inside. I'm gonna go ahead and go over sitting position, starting up front, getting in, like Todd mentioned when you we were talking about the air suspension, it's super easy when the car is nice and low. Uh, when it is up high, it's a bit more difficult. When I close the door in here, the quality of everything is just absolutely fantastic. This car was over six figures when it was new, so that's what you should uh, expect. But the cool thing, not only are the materials exceptionally good, but just the sitting position and where you can put all your arms, your legs is awesome. There's so much space and stuff to put your foot. Uh, you got armrests on both sides. You got an armrest up here and an armrest down here and an armrest over here. You can change the height of the armrest with the knob right here. I mean, there's just no way you cannot be comfortable in this car. Let's move to the back. Check out this move. Bam! Let me get in here. Cool belt. It's also important to note that we do have a lot of modern day tech in the 2010 through 12 Range Rover. Heated seats, cooled seats. Uh, in the back, we even have heated seats along with climate control. Three zone climate control, uh, driver, passenger, as well as back seat. What I can tell you, this is the most impressive climate control I have ever seen. You can have dramatic temperature changes uh, from each of those zones. Pretty cool. It really is pure luxury. Uh, this model does not have it, but there are options for reclining rear seats as well as rear seat entertainment. Granted, that technology is getting 10, 11 years old, so keep that in mind. But the headroom, the overall just sense of being in a Range Rover, it's a whole new level of elegance. Supercharged 550 horse. They did have a naturally aspirated version. However, this is the cream of the crop, over 500 horsepower. Guys, this was a very impressive and still is an impressive motor as far as its capabilities, what it can do. Uh, its competition back then was things like the SRT8 Jeep or the X5M. Uh, this took a little bit to get out of the hole, about a six second zero to 60 time. Some of that competition was uh, a little over a second faster. However, the Range Rover can easily catch back up in that quarter mile time. Uh, you just gotta get the old girl moving. You might need to stop for gas between uh, your, your start and the quarter mile. 
Gas mileage is obviously not great. You can expect anywhere from a, a 14 around the city up to 18 or 19 on a road trip. The items that make the 2010 through 2012 worth purchasing versus the older generation is the tech that's in it, in my opinion. We did get some changes to the terrain response where we got some downhill assist. Uh, the other big one to me is the, the display, your instrument cluster. Uh, it's beautiful. I think this is one of the most well done instrument clusters I have ever been in in a vehicle. That is even current day. The way that uh, the different options or the different features that you have enabled just overlay each other, it's just so smooth. It's well done, it's elegant. Uh, I really enjoy watching the instrument cluster in the Range Rover. Instrument clusters inside of the Range Rover, including all the climate control, it was actually designed to be able to use with big clunky gloves on. So you have these well done aluminum uh, outside buttons all the controls are just they're they feel good to turn they click they feel nice in the hand uh, and, and they were made to have big bulky gloves on it was one of their points i personally love it i love the simplicity i love all the different options how you can individualize it i truly love driving this vehicle it, it is just uh it's a, a complete statement uh, and I don't feel that I need to drive fast. I don't feel like this is a sports car. It's just awesome that it has the capability uh, that if you go into a turn uh, aggressively or if you uh, hit that gas pedal down, it's quite amazing what this over 6,000 pound vehicle is capable of doing. It stays level, it stays planted, it does what you ask of it. Uh, the supercharged V8, it's pretty cool that even under uh, medium acceleration, you can pick up on that supercharger noise. Uh, but I don't find myself wanting to drive this car fast. I just, uh, I like the authority, the feeling of authority that driving the Range Rover Supercharge gives. It's, uh, it, it is a quite unique experience. Uh, and I think that is a part why this is just already a, considered a classic vehicle. They do date back to 2001, uh, but I think with the timeless design, as well as just the unique capability, there's really nothing like it, uh, that this will be a sought after vehicle for quite some time. When they were entering into the third generation and the design aspect of it, um, the they were under BMW ownership. So it started off with a lot, if not all, BMW tech. Uh, the, the designers, there was four of them that kind of went into the competition to see who would be uh, choose the final design, two of which were BMW designers and the other two were Land Rover designers. The head designer, uh, and, and I spent some time just trying to process this in my brain, and I don't know if I came up with it completely, but the head designer um, got his inspiration, or the designer that won, from a classic Range Rovers, which you could look back down the timeline, and they've just, they're boxy and they kind of have a statement. But the other inspiration was, uh, I'm kind of blanking a little bit, but I think I'll get it right. Forgive me if I don't. Uh, Rivera boats. So those old, elegant um, wooden boats. They, that brand, they make other boats as well. Uh, but that's what, what his inspiration behind the design of the third generation Range Rover was. And I do believe you see that more when you get the two-tone Range Rovers or the autobiographies where the, the roof is a different color from the body. Uh, that's where I was kind of seeing a lot of those design similarities uh, with the boat. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to today's video. Be sure to smash subscribe and hit that like button and check out the other three, part, three videos in our th four part three series, I should say, because it was a three part series. We added a fourth, just check them all out. They'll be up in the corners here. Uh, have a great day. Comment down below what you think of the L322.